Um, so now, uh, last but certainly not least, um, we have jo Johanna Mustafa from Polygon Education Fund to present the modified version of the Congressional Advocacy Training. Um, Joanna has a passion for civil rights work and brings years of experience in national and grassroots advocacy and organizing work. Um, she is the policy and advocacy manager at Polygon, where she develops and executes advocate, <laughs> advocacy strategies in support of Polygon's uh, policy agenda. And prior to joining Polygon, uh, she served as an advocacy specialist for the National Network of Arab American Communities. I'm very excited for this because I haven't been through the training yet myself, so I'm ready to learn to learn a lot right now in the next 20, 25 minutes. So please, help me welcome Joanna Mustafa. Um, the floor is yours. Thank you, Ibrahim. Um, I am honored to share space with all of you. Let me uh, share my screen and get started with our training. All right. Can you all see my, uh, my screen? Is everything okay? I'm going to see it. All right, wonderful. So thank you all, Salam alaikum. I'm very happy to be joining you today and sharing space with you for such an important event. Uh, mashallah, there is a wealth of knowledge on this call from leaders who have been spearheading the work for years. And I'm so proud to see our American Muslim community coming together and organizing for halal inclusivity. Um, it seems like a lot of folks on this call already have a passion for advocacy and already recognize the importance of the work. So I was asked to give a brief um, modified version of our Advocacy 101 training, just kind of as a refresher for those who are experts, but also um, a guide for those who are starting their journey in advocacy and a tool for all community members because we can all take action, not just policy experts. So I would like to start by speaking a little bit about the different sources of influence. Um, it's really important to think about how money in politics is not the only factor influencing governance and policy. And I think a lot of times even experts forget that. So in addition to special interest groups such as lobbyists and big donors, our elected officials are also influenced by other party leaders and colleagues, media, and of course, electoral prospects because most elected officials want re-election. So just you know, before we get started in talking about the different tips and avenues and tools that we can use as ad advocates, um, I think just to keep that in mind and think about all the different power dynamics that come with it. And so with that being said, I would like to highlight that as constituents, our work is very, very crucial and very important. Um, we really do have the power to put and keep elected officials in office. At the end of the day, they are public servants that work for us. And so in order to ensure such meaningful and reflective representation on all levels of government and on all issues, not just halal inclusivity, we must utilize and seek to master the tools and avenues at our disposal. Um, I would also like to share a couple of brief statistics um, before I delve into the tips. Just to show that if you ever doubt your role as a constituent, whether you're joining us live or here on the Zoom call, you know, even experts, sometimes we get burnt out and we question <laughs> the system sometimes. Uh, I want you to reconsider the lens from which you are looking at this work. So as someone who has worked in a congressional office and was on the other side of the phone taking constituent calls and listening to their demands and concerns, I really want to uplift and assure you that your efforts are never a waste. Um, and as you can see here, the Congressional Management Foundation reports that direct constituent interactions have more influence on lawmakers' decisions than other strategies. So don't let lobbyists and big donors intimidate you. I also will be sharing just one more, <laughs> uh, a couple more statistics showing how 94% of staffers also believe that constituent advocacy 
impacts undecided lawmakers, which is another great point to keep in mind whenever we're looking to um, move issues within Congress or any other institution really, is that sometimes we have the ability to move undecided or you know, uh, neutral lawmakers who may not be fully on our side yet. Um, it's also good to note that 79% of staffers also believe personal stories help shape um, legislators' opinions and eventually their vote and their action on a specific piece of legislation. And um, I've heard this throughout the webinar today as well, is that, you know, we need to make the ask, we need to represent our narrative, our stories. Um, and we'll talk about this a little bit uh, in a, a, a little bit more um, in just a few minutes. So now I want to use the legislative branch, you know, Congress, as an example to um, speak about how we interact and engage in advocacy efforts. I also want to point out, like Amma said, that, um, and others on this call, is that a lot of the um, advocacy efforts on this specific issue and all other issues impacting our community um, are also local and state level efforts. So with that in mind, everything that I will be presenting, think of it as a science that you can apply to all levels of government. But for the sake of convenience, since we're all familiar with Congress, I believe, I will be using that as an example. All right, so. First thing to think about before you even make that first contact with your elected official is to know the policy making process. I think especially for constituents, um, this may seem a little bit intimidating, not knowing how policy even passes in Congress or how it moves forward uh, on a local and state level even. So just do your research for, um, Congress, as you can see, the bill is introduced in either chamber. Um, it is then sent to a committee, then goes for a floor vote, and then um, the both chambers combine the, the policy, and then hopefully it will make it to the president's table and uh, goes into law. So that's like a very simple, simplified version of how policy um, works on a federal level. Um, I won't be delving into too much detail, but just wanted to point out that before you even um, engage with any elected official, it's important to know how they, um, how policymaking works. And then in addition to that, it's also important to be aware of um, not only the elected officials role in policymaking, but also how other people around the elected official interact with that individual. So um, if we're speaking about Congress, you, uh, it would be good to, to have an idea of um, the congressional office and the hierarchy and bureaucracy um, of how things move in that one specific office. So if you're trying to reach, let's say your representative in the house, um, many times you will probably be making an ask of, um, or communicating with a staff assistant or an intern, especially for an initial call. And especially if you're a constituent. Um, it's also not always very realistic to schedule um, a office visit or a call with your member of Congress. So just to keep in mind that no, regardless of who you speak to at a congressional office, let's say you start with an intern, it will go to the staff assistant, they'll make a note of it, it will then go to the legislative director or who, whatever staffer is working on that specific issue, who oftentimes actually has more um, knowledge on the issue than the Congress member. And then it will move forward to the chief of staff and Congress member. And if for some reason you do have the connections to get a meeting with the member of Congress, or if the member of Congress has the time and is able to meet with you and the allies and the community members, at the end of the day, 
all that knowledge that you communicate with the member of Congress will also go back to the staffers who will essentially be doing uh, a lot of the workload and the research on policy and interacting with the committee and the constituents because at the end of the day, they are the experts on that specific issue. So just wanted to flag that and put it out there. Um, don't be intimidated, you know, by all the different staffers that you're engaging with and feel like your, your message is not being reflected or received because they will definitely make a note of it. Um, and so now that we've kind of addressed, um, I would say the general reminders to keep in mind, uh, I want to go over a couple of tips and guidelines in terms of how to contact your member of Congress. And again, I also want to highlight that we are speaking about Congress right now, but um, a lot of these also apply for local and state level offices as well. For House and Senate, you can easily find your members on the House uh, website and the Senate website. If you are looking for an elected official on a more local or state level, the state and local um, websites are also very helpful. So let's say if you're looking for a school board member, um, you can easily find everyone on board if you just Google the school district. Uh, same goes for city council and all other um, state elected officials as well. For Congress, you can also easily call them at the number shown on the slide. Um, this is more of a directory um, uh, or like an operator that basically takes you to the specific office that you're looking for. So you can call them, they'll ask you if you're calling for the House or the Senate, and then um, take you to that specific office. Once you get on that call, it's very, very important to identify yourself. So if you're a policy expert or calling from a specific organization, it's very important to flag that as soon as you get on that call. If you're a constituent, then that's even better. And it's also very important to, to make sure that they know they're speaking to you as a constituent um, because they will immediately make a note of every single thing that you say. It's also very important to prepare a script. And I say that um, because it's important to keep it short, um, one issue per email or call and explain why the issue is important to you. Think about how folks have very short time spans. And so you really want to make that elevator pitch in one minute, no more than one minute, otherwise you will lose the, the person that you're talking to. Um, and while you're talking about the issue, don't forget to make a very, very clear ask. Um, not only should you make a clear ask, but also a feasible or exist, you know, a feasible ask that identifies an existing problem or an existing bill. For instance, if you're calling Congress and you already know there's a bill going up for a markup in a committee or um, going to the floor for a vote, then you can simply mention that bill and say, would the member of Congress or would you know, Representative X vote yes on the specific bill? So just keep it as simple as possible because you should keep in mind that they're receiving a lot of different calls on many, many issues, especially for speaking about the federal um, level. And so I kind of drafted a very simple uh, script for what that looks like. Um, if you are calling, let's, for the sake of this webinar, pretend that there's a bill in Congress called Food Justice in Schools Act. Um, so you would call and mention your name, mention that you're a constituent, I'm calling you to vote yes on the Food Justice in Schools Act. Every Muslim child should have affordable access to halal foods, including school meals. Unfortunately, many Muslim kids don't eat in schools due to lack of halal options, leaving kids hungry. So in, this, in a very short paragraph, you made an ask, you identified the problem, and you gave a solution in only two, you know, two to three sentences. And then again, reiterate what you're asking for. I urge Representative X to speak for the Food Justice in Schools Act. Will the representative do so? 
I forgot to include it here in my draft, but it's also very helpful to always ask a question at the end. This will require a response most of the time. So you can get that immediate follow up. The staffer will tell you yes or no, or say, you know what? Um, the member of Congress is undecided right now. Getting that piece of information is very important because it then helps you mobilize around that issue. If you know your member of Congress is already voting yes on a specific bill or championing an issue in, in Congress or any other institution, um, then you can move to other elected officials. If you know they're not supporting, you can mobilize around it. And if you know they're undecided, then you have a better chance of moving them uh, to, to your side. And then, um, of course, right now with the pandemic, a lot of the uh, congressional office visits and just meeting with your elected official in general have been done virtually over Zoom. I think they've become even more accessible for a lot of folks. So I encourage everyone here to really meet with their congressional members, again, whether you're a constituent, just really passionate about a specific issue. They usually have um, uh, calls specifically for constituents on Fridays. And if you're a policy expert, um, a policy expert, I'm sure that you're already doing that advocacy and meeting with the senators and the House representatives on specific issues with coalition members. Um, but the basics to keep in mind in terms of how to efficiently meet with your member of Congress is to one, of course, schedule your meeting. And you can do so by uh, putting a request on their website. Usually they have a form that you can fill out. You can also reach out to the scheduler and see if they're available to meet with you, if the member of Congress or any staff member is available. Um, or you can simply call and ask for a meeting. But before you even go into that call or in-person uh, visits, once COVID, you know, we're, we're fully um, recovered from the pandemic and we can resume uh, traditional work, it's very important that you do your research. So learn about the member. Do they sit on any committees? What is their voting record? Did they make a public statement on the issue or not yet? Um, having all of that knowledge will help you frame how you speak on the issue and how to, to move them um, on that specific piece of legislation. Um, it's also important to organize yourselves once you're presenting at the meeting. Uh, for instance, if we're speaking about coalition calls with many different policy ex experts, we usually have one leader who we call the facilitator, uh, speaking on behalf of the entire coalition and then presenting the values, presenting um, the ask, presenting some context, uh, addressing the problem, the solution. In addition to that, it also helps to have a constituent speak personally on uh, how they're impacted and also another person or a couple more people speak about a personal story that resonates and that you know, um, relates to the issue at hand. And of course, make sure that the ask is very, very clear. After um, conducting the visit, which usually doesn't take longer than 30 minutes, it's also very important to go back and debrief with the um, either coalition members that you've joined for that meeting or any other community members and constituents that you were with simply to make note of everything that was discussed during the meeting but also um to to reflect on what was said to see if there are any next steps that you need to take any new strategies that you need to think of and also uh, ways to follow up with that particular elected official um and I really want to uplift this. Follow-up is probably the most important thing about this whole program. Consistency matters. Consistency over years sometimes, as we've seen with the Muslim ban, for instance, we're still advocating for a no-ban act, um, even after the, the repeal by the Biden administration. So some pieces of legislation or policy issues 
really do take a lot of years and a lot of commitment and consistency. And that goes, um, uh, you know, basically into following up just on an individual level, even to begin with. So being consistent, even with our interactions. Um, so I say, I say it here again, follow up, follow up, follow up, very important. Send a thank you to basically show the elected official that you appreciate the time that they took to meet with you. Track the issue if it's in Congress, you can track the bills on congress.gov. Uh, if it's on a state and local level, there are also other ways that you can tra um, track the issue and the bill. If there isn't a bill yet, you can introduce that idea. And I think, I wasn't sure if it was uh, Brother Shaquille or Ahmad who brought this up, but um, it's very important that we take initiative. If there isn't a piece of legislation in Congress right now or in, um, on a local and state level, you can be that person that meets with an elected official and say, this, there's a gap that we need to fill. There's a problem that we need to fix. How can you do that? And then they will hopefully take initiative and uh, draft a solution for it. It's also very important in terms of Congress to meet with your members, members of Congress when they're doing district work in recess. So um, I believe our senators just um, will be coming back from recess actually on Tuesday. So the past couple of weeks, we've been heavily engaging with senators, advocating on specific policies that we're spearheading um, and making sure that our constituents and our network is really, you know, um, are really sending out those emails, those action alerts, making those calls and helping us advocate as well. Um, and again, try again, try again, even you know, if you get a no the first time, meet again and make a different case, find a different angle, maybe go in with more coalition members, with more allies, um, restructure the way you're, you're talking about your issue. Finally, I just want to talk about two more things that I think people also often forget when we speak about advocacy. So advocacy work is yes, a lot of calling, a lot of emailing, action alerts um, that involve constituents, um, but also just having a consistent and found, uh, a strongly founded relationship with your elected official. And I think this is even more important for local offices. Um, you know, engage with them at community events. Know them on a more personal level. A lot of times if we're speaking about local and state um, elected officials, they're probably your neighbor or, um, you know, just down the road from you. They're, they're not very far. And they really, should understand um, the issues that the community is going through or is impacted by. So make sure that you are engaging at events, at town hall meetings. Um, a lot of those are organized virtually at the moment, um, but it's still an opportunity to attend and make your voice heard. So when doing so, a lot of what I mentioned earlier also applies to this. So introduce yourself, Make sure that you say that you're a constituent, make sure that you thank them, tell a personal story um, that can um, grab their attention um, and then make that very clear direct ask and follow up. In addition to town halls, I think le letter, not me, everyone thinks, <laughs> it's proven that letter writing campaigns uh, are also very effective. Um, it's effective because not only are you making a demand or uplifting an issue, but you, in, in the letter that you send to that elected official, you are essentially educating them on that issue as a constituent, as a policymaker, as a community member. Um, again, it's also important to keep it short. Identify yourself, have focus points, have a, a very brief and concise um, argument. Uh, choose up to three, you know, points uh, for, for your argument. Don't give them a research paper um, and make it personal. Make it as personal as possible to showcase the impact and then ask for a response and give um, your contact information so that they can follow up with you. 
Another way letter writing is very helpful is that it shows up in numbers. So if you are mobilizing the community to send a thousand letters to one office, imagine what that looks like if you're a staffer. <laughs> if you're getting a thousand emails or hundreds of emails or you're getting actual letters in the mail, whatever it is that you're sending, it will show up as numbers. And that is also very impactful. Um, in addition to, to letter writing, another avenue that you can use if you feel you know you can write and uplift an issue on a more um, uh, on a larger scale, consider utilizing uh, op eds. So those are also very short, but then um, they not only educate and target the elected official but also spread awareness for the larger collective, for the larger community. So um, you basically, you are, you're mobilizing, you're organizing at this point. You're not just targeting one person, but just speaking about the issue um, in general. Similarly to all other um, tips that I, that I mentioned, it's important to have a hook to make that pitch uh, to, to share something that is strong, that is um, a, you know, a staggering fact or make an observation that might not be very obvious to everyone. Uh, have your key messages uh, very clear. Uh, end it uh, on a strong point, a memorable point. Show the impact, uh, the human impact, the lived experiences of the people I think are very, very important in everything that you do. And then um, know your audience as well. Um, who are you speaking to and frame your, your message around that and write it in proper form, of course. With that, I will end and say that numbers matter. So we spoke about consistency. We spoke about the different tools that you can use from calling, emailing, sending letters, uh, attending town hall meetings, community events, uh, writing op-eds. All of those matter because it, show, it shows people power. Again, we spoke about people power earlier and numbers really show people power. We can't have two people um, only advocating for an issue. We need the entire community. Two people can lead an initiative. Two people can start that spark and initiate, initiate that thought. But for us to actually have meaningful policy change, we will need all of us. And think about, I use this as an example all the time when we talk about advocacy, uh, especially in Congress. Think of it this way. If you make five calls, it will put the policy issue on the agenda. If you make seven calls in a day, it will keep your policy on the agenda. And if you make 10, it will definitely put your policy at the top of the agenda for the next staff meeting. All right, so I guess that wasn't my ending point. <laughs> my ending point, uh, I just want to leave you with a success story. And this was actually something that was brought to my attention by Ahmad, so thank you for that. But we had a, um, a case in San Diego, not too long ago, a few years ago, uh, where a group of youth basically mobilized and organized towards having halal meets in this uh, San Diego school district. And I think this is a very, very strong um, success story because it really uplifts how impacted folks use their voice to address the issue. And I just want to highlight a couple of things from what I've learned um, about this specific campaign. So if we look at the org leading the effort, you'll find that they were successful because they connected the halal inclusivity issue in schools to the broader food justice issue. So um, by doing so, instead of isolating their cause to a Muslim specific framework, they were able to mobilize not only the impacted, but everyone and anyone who believes children should have food on the table. I think this is a very, very important point, is how we not only advocate for our impacted committee, but make sure that it reflects the values of the larger collective of the nation. How do we 
um, interact with allies and uh, bring in more people from other communities to champion our cause as well. In addition to that, they focus on schools serving immigrant communities, many of whom are refugees in San Diego, with children who depended on school meals for their daily meals. So um, using that angle is very, very crucial because it showcases the urgency that comes with advocating for low-income immigrant children whose basic religious and uh, religious rights and nutrition needs aren't fulfilled um, at that particular school district. It's also important to note that influencing change in those low-income schools will likely open up more opportunities for other schools in that area uh, and may, maybe even spread to a, a, a state level and then from that state level we can take it to a federal level. When interviewed, um, I have a, a couple of uh, screenshots on here. So when interviewed, one of the youth leaders identified um, a couple of memorable, um, I'm forgetting my English, but <laughs> identified a couple of important things for the way they advocated and organized around the issue. The first thing is that they identified an issue, which is important because we have a lot of issues impacting our community. But what is even more important is to come up with a solution or at least suggest a solution. Um, in their case, they provided the halal chicken option for students in that particular school district, which was feasible, easily implemented, and fixes the problem. They also emphasize that anyone can benefit from those meals, not just Muslim students. Again, thinking about how not only you are advocating for your own community members and impacted folks, but also how you can get, uh, how you can benefit the larger society, how you can benefit everyone while doing so. And then the last point is that, um, and this is something we often don't think about, but the campaign was also youth led and I find a lot of power in that. The people closer to the problem are oftentimes uh, closer to the solution. So including impacted folks, in this case students, and having them really take the charge and take the lead and meet with elected officials and share the, their voice is very, very important. And it's honestly, um, probably one of the strongest um, tactics used for that campaign because it's very hard to look at a child and say, I disagree with you, you know, I, you shouldn't have uh, halal meals or get a meal uh, in school. So highlighting the, the hardship, highlighting the lived experiences is very important with anything that you work on, anything you advocate for. So I will leave it at that um, and just say you got this, you have an advantage. Again, whether you are a policy expert or a constituent, you do have the power because you are closer to the problem and you know the solution. And um, we'll open it up for q and I believe. Thank you so much for listening to me. Thank you so much for that uh, training, Joanna. Um, there was a ton of actionable items for us to take and that we can go, you know, even, well, today's a Saturday, so maybe not today, but this week we can go and, uh, you know, just call our senators, contact the Congress, uh, follow up with them, call the representatives, and kind of just start this process of, you know, making our voices heard and amplifying um, the, the Muslim community's voices as a whole. So thank you very much for that, Joanna.